Jeju, a peaceful island located south of the Korean Peninsula. Started in 2001, the Jeju Forum is an annual event where international scholars converge to discuss about peace and prosperity in Asia. This year's main theme was re-engineering peace for Asia. Since the success of the Inter-Korea Summit and the North Korea-US Summit, there was a core focus at the forum on how to successfully establish peace on the Korean Peninsula. 71 talk sessions were held across five fields – peace, prosperity, sustainability, diversity and global Jeju. As a country directly involved with North Korea's nuclear problem, and as an intermediary power keeping peace in Northeast Asia, what role does South Korea need to take? We looked into Korea's and Northeast Asia's strategies for peace and prosperity from a public diplomacy standpoint. As you know, uh, we are living in the era of public diplomacy. Most countries actually they are quite uh, keen about uh, its uh, national image and uh, its the national brand. They very much would like to create a favorable uh, international uh, opinion in support of their own national policies. Northeast Asia is uh, no exception, and Korea, Japan, and China all are very active in uh, conducting public uh, diplomacy. In Korea, uh, we are also latecomer in the field of public diplomacy, but uh, we are trying to be very active in promoting national image and making friends uh, with foreign people to win heart and mind of foreign public. I am uh, ambassador for public diplomacy. Uh, this position was uh, just uh, two years ago, it was uh, created. So we are somewhat late in conducting public diplomacy, but we are quite uh, serious. With respect to the Northeast Asia region, and with respect to public diplomacy in this region, I believe we face uh, two challenges. Uh, one is uh, some nationalistic trend. China, Japan, Korea, all we witness uh, some nationalistic trend in our own I mean, place. I'm afraid that public diplomacy will not be able to play a positive role in building solidarity and peace. Uh, uh, harmony in this reason. So that's uh, one challenge we face. And the second challenge uh, we face is the current uh, situation of the peninsula. And uh, we are at a very critical juncture uh, to change the historic course, uh, overcoming all the uh, seven decades uh, hostility and conflicts uh, in this region and uh, turning into uh, peace on the peninsula. So creating lasting peace in, uh, on the peninsula by solving North Korean nuclear and missile uh, problems uh, in a, through a diplomatic way, it's uh, quite a big challenge it to us, uh, not only for, for South Koreans, but also for whole reason and uh, for the international community. So we uh, wonder what kind of uh, role public diplomacy uh, can contribute uh, to achieving uh, this ultimate goal of peace on the peninsula. So against uh, this backdrop, uh, we, uh, at this session, we would like to analyze cases of public diplomacy of three major nations in our region uh, to examine the implication of direction and strategy for future public diplomacy of our three countries. In order to discuss these issues, I'd like to invite three speakers uh, 
uh, to share their opinions and uh, uh, views. Can I uh, ask uh, Senator uh, Masukawa to make some short presentation? I'm not necessarily a very much expert on public diplomacy, but um, as on behalf of Japan, I hope that um, what my presentation can be helpful for understanding what's Japanese public diplomacy history and if there is any uh, hints that could be for your country, although I think Korea is really good at it, uh, I'm really happy. Long from long time before, I, I think it's Korea has been very keen on public diplomacy, although you didn't use the name of public diplomacy. And I still remember uh, that, um, I forgot whether it was uh, Kim Dae-jung, Dae or who, what else. A Korean government established a national branding committee to uh, find out what's the strength of Korea from outside viewpoint. Not what Korean people think, oh, this is great about Korea, or that point is great about Korea, but uh, I think Korean government introducing how to brand a nation perspective uh, much long before that Japan realizes. Now Japanese government do the similar thing, but I think you did start it 10 years much uh, earlier. But what Japan has been doing is the um, much more steady uh, cultural diplomacy. Japanese uh, origin of the Japanese public diplomacy goes back to maybe after the war, as Japan determined to recover as a peaceful nation and the nurture uh, to, to the friendship among the countries around, uh, Japan uh, studied the, um, the cultural diplomacy, such as introducing tea ceremony to other countries, or the ikebana, the um, flower arrangement of the Japanese traditional style. So for example, uh, if Japanese embassies in Korea or maybe other countries hold um, the tea ceremony events regularly to let the people to, of the foreign countries to understand the Japanese culture. Or maybe when the foreign guests come to Japan, we bring those important guests, foreign guests to um, kabuki or the sumo uh, restaurant so that they can get familiar with Japanese culture. So and then the J Japanese government didn't spend so much money for that. Among the foreign policy, this cultural exchange was pretty, not in a priority, I would say, but Japanese government has doing this kind of cultural exchange and disseminating the, our information about the tradition pretty steadily for a long time, continued. And I think it helped to some extent to, um, for the foreign people to create an image of Japan that is peaceful and has a lot of deep tradition, but with a technologically advanced country. So I, I think it was it's been helpful. So the soft power, as Joseph and I, uh, Professor Joseph and I uh, pointed out, is critical now in the public in diplomacy itself. And the purpose of public diplomacy, I would say, uh, to disseminate the basic uh, position and important foreign policies of the governments to understand the international community, as well as by the foreign people. And secondly, increase positive image of your country to foreign people. Currently, uh, what the Japanese government is doing is to utilize the Japanese pop culture or the, uh, a, as a tool for the cultural diplomacy. And among young people, um, pop manga or animation is very popular. And I think the recent Japanese movie, um, I don't know how to translate it in Korean, Your Name, um, was very, uh, was, became a big hit in Japan, but also in Korea and other Asian countries too. And um, I think it's contributed to create certain image of Japan as uh, some fresh uh, image of Japan by the ordinary people of other countries. And the same way, I think the BTS, Bantan Sonyondan, <laughs> they are really popular in Japan and they sing in Japanese too. And I'm sure the uh, government of Korea has a, hasn't paid a penny to them. <laughs> but I think BTS is doing a great job for Korea, and Korean people, and image to, to, to uh, improve and then make a fashionable image of Korea, new Korea, right? So I, I, you know, public diplomacy by nature is not, not something that government is doing this and that. It's a um, continuous collaboration of what you have.
And then I think Korea has lots of uh, assets. Korean pop culture, K-pop, and, and also the drama, Korean dramas. And um, it's not starting from now. I, I, I think you have a long history. So um, I think it's Japan that has to learn from Korea rather than Japan teaches this and that to, to Korea. No, so, but I, I think we can share the experiences. Japan does appreciate the, uh, the ordinary, traditional, country-to-country uh, -country, um, memorial events. And with Korea, most important thing is this year, 2018, marks the anniversary of 20th anniversary of the Obuchi, Kim Dae-jun partnership uh, declaration. And I think it's true, like Japan and Korea has lots of uh, difficult issues among each other. But um, I think Kim Dae-jung Obuchi era is one of the best eras between Japan and Korea. And I hope that um, uh, this year, since it's a 20th anniversary, I do hope the um, now that Korean Peninsula is becoming so dynamic, so historical importance because of this North Korean issue, uh, it's time for Japan and Korea realizing the 20th anniversary um, to make friendship and public diplomacy can certainly play a role. Japan uh, recently created the Japan House Project, which is a one-stop service to disseminate Japanese culture and food and uh, information. So this is a new project. And lastly, to touch upon the, the question about what could be the uh, public diplomacy could play a role for increasing the peace and the stability in the peninsula. I mean, I think you're doing that already. Uh, President Moon Jae-in did make use of the um, Pyeongchang Olympic game as a place for um, the starts of the dialogue between North and South, and which led to the um, US-North Korea summit. And actually, I, I should say, Kim, Mr. Kim Jong-un is a fantagista <laughs> for diplomacy. He himself, Successful in, it was very successful in changing the image of North Korea, which was a dictatorship, too, somewhat friendly, and a country with a new leader who hopes for economic development or denuclearization, whatever. I really hope that what we have to remember is to the process from now, after the summit is most important, it's now we are in, in that process. The new denuclearization should not be forgotten. The peace doesn't come from just the image of this friendly atmosphere. It has to have the basis, denuclearization. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Senator Matsugawa. Um, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts uh, on uh, public uh, diplomacy. Senator Matsugawa uh, rightly uh, reminded us that our ultimate uh, goal is denuclearization and uh, placing peace mechanism, lasting peace in this region. And the public diplomacy can do a lot uh, to disseminate the image of bright future of this region if and when North Korea uh, changes its, its course and the cha changes its uh, uh, calculation and put it on the right uh, track. Uh, then uh, let me invite uh, Professor Jay Wang, a leading scholar on public <laughs> diplomacy. Can you share uh, with us your thoughts on public diplomacy in this region? Good afternoon, thank you very much, Ambassador Park. It is a great pleasure to be here. And uh, on behalf of the USC Center on Public Diplomacy, let me also add welcome to all of you to our panel. Realizing that we have tons of expertise on this panel uh, on public diplomacy uh, by uh, Korea, by Japan, and also by China, uh, what I'll do is um, I'll talk a little bit about my observations on some of the trends um, that we are seeing uh, in this field of public diplomacy, and then we can certainly discuss what are the implications uh, in this particular region and some of the issues and challenges that um, uh, the region is facing. So public diplomacy in general, uh, we refer to uh, this activity, this practice, as a nation's outreach to people from around the world. And this, it has come a very long way. So let me um, uh, quote, um, the British diplomat Harold Nicholson, uh, he wrote uh, right after the Second World War 
So this is what he said. In the days of the old diplomacy, it would have been regarded as an act of unthinkable vulgarity to appeal to the common people upon any issue of international policy. Now fast forward to 2017, the US Secretary of Defense, uh, James Mattis, remarked in the context of fighting ISIS, quote, America has got two fundamental powers, the power of intimidation and the power of inspiration. Soft power is largely found in the power of inspiration, and it's part and parcel of how we defeat this enemy. And uh, Joseph Nye, uh, who, uh, who coined the term soft power, and uh, this is what he said, in today's global information age, victory may sometimes depend not on whose army wins, but on whose story wins. So clearly, we see that public diplomacy is an essential foreign policy tool to advance global security as well as local prosperity, to build and strengthen alliances with friendly nations, and to combat and undermine disinformation and mistrust. Given the changes in geopolitics and also the advances in information technology, um, we are seeing that public diplomacy is also being disrupted by some of these societal forces. Uh, let me just outline a few of them. Um, first, uh, the demographic shifts. So globally and also regionally, as we have seen that, uh, there's aging population in many parts of the world, especially developing economies, and uh, we are seeing urbanization, and we are seeing ethnic remapping uh, with migration in many countries. So fundamentally, uh, public diplomacy as a communication-centric activity, our audiences, our audiences are changing. So our audiences are changing, meaning that the strategies need to change, right? So that's the first uh, trend that we're seeing. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, the continued advances in information technology, and we are seeing the pace and the disruption will continue to accelerate. Uh, in terms of the use of, use of artificial intelligence, uh, complex modeling and uh, computing, and the mixed realities, and how that impacts the way the platforms, the tools that we use in public diplomacy. And uh, certainly there's, there's the geopolitical uncertainty. Uh, how are we going to evolve uh, a so-called new world order um, in terms of security order, in terms of economic order, and the resurgent nationalism in many parts of the world. And the most uh, uh, disconcerting is that there is domestic discord on how countries should engage globally. And there's a lack of new vision, as I was saying earlier, what the new world order uh, should be like in the 21st century. And fourth, there's the emergence of a non-state world. That is, non-state actors such as cities and multinational businesses are increasingly engaged in confronting global challenges. And another thing we need to note is uh, uh, what's under the sustainable development, uh, this big umbrella. Many of these issues are issues of a transnational nature. So the issues uh, that public diplomacy uh, need to deal with are also uh, uh, issues that uh, have a transnational um, a scope. And so how do we work on those issues as public diplomacy has been traditionally very nation state centric? How do we find non-state solutions to some of these global challenges? In a nutshell that for public diplomacy work, our audiences are changing, our platforms and tools are changing, the context in which we conduct public diplomacy is changing, um, the, the players, the actors who are involved are changing, and the issues that we need to address are also changing. So, as I said earlier, that public diplomacy is being disrupted uh, by all these major forces that are also disrupting uh, other sectors uh, of our society. Now, here are a few takeaways. The first is that there is a need uh, to make public diplomacy more strategic rather than just a tactical issue or tactical solution through a deeper understanding um, of how people behave and what is the theory of change in a digital environment. Uh, fundamentally, we are asking the question is, what are the psychological underpinnings of human behavior uh, in this uh, brand new world of digital uh, information uh, environment that we live in? For instance, how do we build trust in this kind of environment, right? How do we combat 
uh, counter disinformation. Second, there is a need to better understand the increasing interaction between the digital and the physical world and experiences and integrate our online and offline efforts. Uh, we don't have a very clear idea at this point. What is our audience's information journey in the ways that where, where, do, where does the contact point start and what are the set of, set of these relationships we have through our, uh, throughout a process that we wanted to engage uh, through them. Is it coming from face to face? Or is it coming from the digital? So that, in that information map needs to be, be very clearly mapped out because otherwise it's very hard for us to deploy our communication strategies, right? So, so that's a very uh, big challenge at this point that most, uh, we just don't know, in fact. Uh, what actually, what's the journey people actually undergo? And, and we may need to rethink how we operate uh, what's the operational model for public diplomacy? Because currently, when you look around the world, it's very similar foreign ministries, and then there's a department that, you know, uh, overseeing a public diplomacy effort, and then there are other, you know, agencies at the federal level, uh, uh, I mean, overseeing different aspects of all of this. Um, uh, do we need to rethink how we should organize, or how we should operate uh, public diplomacy? As I was saying earlier, communication cross-platforms um, are changing and there's a bias towards visual, interactive, immersive storytelling and it demands authenticity and directness rather than distance and formality. And there's a need to develop global networks and partnerships to seek non-state-based solutions to common global challenges and to harness the productive role of the sub-national actor and third party. And finally, there's a need to reskill and upskill in key functional areas, including visual, social storytelling, integrative community management, information architecture, and audience research and impact. Because all of this are, reflect, are reflective of some of the changing the challenges to facing the practice. And if we don't have the skills uh, to deal with this, then it, you know, we may have a very good strategy Then we will not be able to implement and uh, achieve that kind of a public diplomacy success uh, that we envision. So one final thought about Northeast Asia, the region. Um, as I said earlier, that this is actually the moment when we are trying to figure out what is the, uh, the, the new, the 21st century world order. Uh, how should East Asia contribute uh, to the developing of this new world order? I think that's a very critical question. And um, my observations are based primarily on American experiences. And we don't have um, much uh, research and we don't have a lot of um, distilled um, experiences that are coming from other parts of the world, including, uh, for instance, Northeast Asia, to kind of enrich our understanding or discussion of what public diplomacy practice uh, should be, uh, ought to be uh, in the future. So I think this is very, it's an underdeveloped and underexplored area that uh, how would East Asia's experience in public diplomacy inform and enrich our exploration of the power and limits of public diplomacy and soft power in global affairs in the future, which is, a, a, I think, it's a very timely, very important question that we need to uh, look into. So uh, with that, um, I'll, I'll finish here, and then I look forward to a discussion uh, of the pa uh, by the panel of some of these issues, how they, are how they are reflected in Northeast Asia context. Thank you very much. Yeah, Mr. Uh, Jay Wong, as a leading scholar in the field of public diplomacy, he raised so many questions. And uh, we are now undergoing a very speedily changing world, as he said, uh, in terms of audience, in terms of technology, and in terms of issues. Uh, Northeast Asia region could be an experiment uh, place for the future direction of public diplomacy. Uh, so uh, we need uh, actually quite a deep understanding among our three countries, uh, China, Japan, then Korea, and uh, we have to make a, a new culture to collaborate, uh, f not only for this reason, but for the, for the new world order, as you rightly mentioned. And may I invite uh, Professor Nancy Snow, uh, Please share your insights with us. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much, Ambassador Park, for inviting me. 25 years ago, I was working at the United States Information Agency, and our motto then was telling America's story to the world. So this emphasis on storytelling hasn't changed much. If you were to go back to the origin of the coinage of the term public diplomacy, Anybody who reads any literature in public diplomacy comes across the name of Edmund Gillian. And Gillian was trying to come up with a term that would describe efforts at that time by traditional diplomats to engage in outreach to global publics. There was no social media, there was no Facebook, there was no internet. There was the power of television, primarily in film. I have to say that one term that he thought would be more accurate at the time to describe this process was propaganda. <laughs> so in my work in public diplomacy, I'm also known as a propaganda studies scholar. Uh, but I began, uh, after I finished my PhD at American University, to uh, engage in public diplomacy from inside the government. And we had very limited tools available at that time. We didn't even think in terms of digital. We had press releases. We sent artists abroad, as uh, the Honorable Matsukawa has mentioned, the power of cultural diplomacy. When we talk about public diplomacy, we have to think of it in terms of advocacy. We have to think of it in terms of persuasion, social influence, storytelling but it is immersed constantly in policy. And that's what makes it somewhat difficult. I mentioned USIA. USIA was an independent foreign affairs agency to the Department of State. In 1999, it was folded into the State Department. And so now the storytelling is side by side the policy making. That makes it even murkier. There are many of us, next year will be the 20th anniversary of the abolishment of USIA, and many will be hearkening back for that time when we had an independent storytelling agency. So I am here to represent and talk about China, Korea, and Japan because I've done work in public diplomacy in all three. And when we tell our stories, it's very interesting. It would have been just a few months ago that people commenting on this part of the world where we live would probably say, oh, be careful. Uh, watch, watch the skies overhead, because what, we're, what were we dealing with last summer? In Hokkaido, we had missiles flying over. Could we imagine the reality that we are living in now? So now Northeast Asia is looking <laughs> like peace is breaking out, but we shouldn't presume that that is happening. We shouldn't get ahead of ourselves. So just like with uh, the peace process, you have to view public diplomacy as a process. It is dynamic, as Dr. Wang says. It is ongoing. It is never ending. And it is often very exhaust exhaustive work because it is very much about person-to-person -person engagement. So we have the interpersonal level, we have the regional level, we have the international level. Now, I've taught public diplomacy at Tsinghua University. China has a certain advantage in that the global communications continuum is much broader there. There's no problem with using the word propaganda. <laughs> There's no problem with publicity. They're often used interchangeably in public diplomacy. Korea, I really tip my hat, even though I don't have a hat on, but I tip my hat to Korea because I think that, again, in agreement with um, Matsukawa here, uh, Japan is playing catch up. Japan has sort of gotten into this uh, more organized uh, effort in public diplomacy uh, rather late because Japan has a certain benefit in terms of being a cultural superpower. There's no doubt about it. And a lot of emphasis has been put into cultural diplomacy. So the cool Japan and the J-pop, but you have your K-pop as well. I think here in Korea, though, you are more advanced in terms of the infrastructure of public diplomacy. And what I also see is a larger engagement. So I left California. I retired early as professor emeritus because I could see what was happening here. 
in this part of the world. And I think there's an enormous opportunity to come together and to have more collaborative sharing of information, particularly in what I love the most, which is exchange programs. Uh, so for instance, we're doing work now with the Korea Foundation, looking at the government-sponsored exchanges here. The Japanese government has very similar exchange programs that brings foreign students to Japan, just like you have in Korea, just like they have in China. Where we are bereft is we haven't looked at the public diplomacy roles of these students because what they are doing, they are serving as cultural mediators. They are returning to their home countries. They are acting as interpreters and synthesizers of the cultures that have come into contact with each other. So I think the value of the multicultural outlook which is what I live every day because I'm still a US citizen living as a guest in, in an incredible part of the world. But we have a greater Asia too, which is what I discovered going all the way to the Middle East and then back here in Jeju today. And I, and I think that uh, valuing public diplomacy now, it's more critical than ever. And I really want to impart on the young people here to get involved in public diplomacy. Everybody in this room is a public diplomat. And that's something that we need to remember. It's not just scholarship. It's not just practitioner work or training. It is very much about developing that outlook of curiosity and mutual understanding that's so critical to our field. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Nancy Snow. You emphasized on, on uh, the power of storytelling, and storytelling actually it's, it, uh, it's a process and it's uh, dynamic, and uh, it's actually it's uh, exhausted work. Yeah. Uh, but uh, when you have positive return, then uh, it's uh, quite, uh, I mean, public diplomacy is a very effective way mm. to promote uh, not only your image, but also the overall uh, common values. Uh, can I ask uh, our uh, panelists to make some comments? Good afternoon. I'm very happy to talk to you today. So thank you very much for your very interesting comments and presentation. You said that your organization, USI, yeah, it was now incorporated to the Depart State Department in 1999. I just want to ask you, when a country reach a certain condition or level for the public diplomacy, there is no need to have that kind of independent institution. So what do you think about that? You were asking about the need for an official public diplomacy agency and whether or not that will become outmoded. Uh, let's think about the most critical issue before us, uh, which is climate change. Mm -hmm. There are so many issues related to that that have to do with the global commons. And I believe there will always be a need for the official story, telling Korea's story to the world more officially through, say, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Culture, Ministry of Education. And having worked inside the government, I see the value of that. You need a more traditional and formal infrastructure. At the same time, though, as I said earlier, public diplomacy, just like climate change, is everybody's business, everybody's concern. So increasingly in public diplomacy, we are seeing the rise of the non-state actor, the unofficial informant about a culture, about a place. And in terms of trust, we're seeing that that may be a greater opportunity to build trust over time. And this is my experience as I travel internationally and talk about public diplomacy. It's often defined differently nation by nation. But what we ultimately have in common is we have a need to get along better with each other. We have a need to reduce violence, not only to the planet, but from human to human. <laughs> and so if we can use public diplomacy and if I can persuade you, for instance, today, to the value of having a public diplomacy outlook in everything you do, then you will be more aware, perhaps, of what you do and your behavior 
how it impacts and informs and engages with all the people that you come into contact with. It's really important to develop that sensitivity. We are living in an era now where trust is really uh, coming uh, hard. It, it's undersupplied out there. So we need to, in everything we do, build trust. Think about how can I act in a trust building measure? And that can occur inside, officially in an agency, but also widely outside in our unofficial contacts with each other. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. It's great to be among these uh, great panelists from uh, all over the world. Uh, and I remember 10 years ago, I went to uh, Japan uh, representing Korea. By that time, I wasn't a Korean now. I'm a Korean uh, national citizen, <laughs> Korean citizen. Um, we, we had this Korea-China-Japan uh, media workshop, which was hosted by Korean, Japanese, and Korean students. Uh, I was in the Korean team somehow. Uh, it was hosted by Japan Foundation. Uh, at the end of uh, our workshop, there was this senior official from Japan Foundation, and he told us that regardless of what you have done in this workshop, uh, the point that you came together as Korean, Japanese, and Chinese students is an amazing thing. These exchanges have been very important. Uh, we have seen the value of it. We have been talking about these three countries, China, Japan, Korea. But still, um, we have a sec secluded country in this region, North Korea. And we have talked about uh, the importance of uh, reconciliation between North and South and North Korea and the US probably it will open up more possibilities to include uh, North Korea in these exchanges. Because if you want to have public diplomacy, you need to have communication. You need to have exchanges. The more there is exchanges between the scientists, between the artists, between the religious people, between the students of uh, both Koreas or North Korea and the US, probably we will have uh, better chances for collaborative uh, public diplomacy. So I would like to ask whether you see any potential uh, for more people-to-people -people exchanges and whether it would have any impact on uh, the collaborative aspect of public diplomacy between the uh, North and South Korea and between North Korea and the U.S. Thank you. All we can do is uh, <laughs> trying to, uh, um, you know, help uh, us uh, individuals to enlarge, uh, to, to, to enhance our capacity for empathy, right? So I'm using this theory uh, to explain uh, society, uh, but it's a Western um, idea. Uh, I don't know to what extent it applies in this context. Uh, so there is a theory uh, that says that individuals, uh, we, we are moral individuals in the sense that we actually sometimes can think of someone else's interest. And there are times we may even sacrifice our self-interest to help the other people. And we can certainly see that in a family situation, in a, with a friends or in a neighbor and all of that. But as countries, as social organizations, we are immoral in a sense that we are not able to think transcend that. Uh, hence that throughout history, social organizations, social groups always have conflicts. Because globalization, we are more independent, uh, there is more cooperation. Uh, can that uh, lead to sort of the more collaborative uh, efforts um, transcending uh, nation, individual nation, nation states? And especially as we're dealing with some of the uh, global commons issues. Uh, that I don't know, because in human history, one te uh, it tells you a different story, unless, you know, as we revisit some of the historical um, um, uh, experiences that we may discover something we didn't, you know, realize earlier on. But the history so far has tell us that individuals uh, are moral and uh, uh, societies are immoral in a sense that we have less capacity for empathy as a social organization. Professor Rabba Kelly, you have some comments or questions? Sure, thanks. This is not the first time um, MOFA has asked me to speak on public diplomacy. Thank you for having me again, Ambassador. Um, the way I often try to conceptualize this is what um, they often call in graduate programs the grandmother test. 
how can you actually explain these things that all of us really care about a lot, like Korea and Japan and the rest? How can you explain this to your grandmother? How can you explain this to non-expert laymen who just don't know this stuff at the level of detail that we do? Um, I think that's really sort of our, our benchmark, right? Not talking to other people in this region or people in this room, but people outside. So like, what would my mother know about Korea? Not a whole lot. It's just not her area, right? So it just seems to me, it seems to me, let me sort of boil this down then to three sort of problems. The first, sort of, at, I think at the most macro level for Korea is sort of, goes back to the Korean aphorism, right? The shrimp among whales. This is often understood in a geopolitical sense that Korea is sort of wedged in between many larger competing states. And so it is. But I think also sort of the level of cultural diplomacy, I think this is a problem for Korea. For non-Asians, I think discrimination among these three is something of an issue. Um, sort of here in this region, sure, we know this. But if you talk to some random person, some 14-year-old in Brazil or from Saskatchewan or Denmark or something like that, can they actually sketch out to you any kind of meaningful differences between Korea, Japan, and China? Um, I, I just don't know. I just, I just don't know. And that's always struck me as an issue, for, particularly for Korea, because Korea is the smallest of the three. And the larger that China becomes, the more this will become a big issue, not just for Korea, but also for Japan, right? I mean, the Ch China is sort of the future for a lot of people when they think about Asia. And that's going to be a struggle for all the countries around China. And then I think the most specifically to sort of bring this conversation, to keep burning this down towards the specific issue of, uh, of this panel, um, the North Koreans, I think, particularly in Western media, I can't speak to other sort of movie industries, I just don't know enough, but just in Western media, the North Koreans have been for several decades now a quite popular, easy to use, cliched villain, right? The North Koreans show up in movies, they show up in video games all the time. And, and this, is, this, is sort of a, this is sort of an issue, right? I mean, this is why, you know, people talk about North Korea all the time. I mean, this is sort of the image we have out there of North Korea as sort of this like unbelievably powerful state and everything. Even though North Korea is actually quite poor and is, is actually a rather small place, only 23 million people living in North Korea, right? But they have the, the, the popular image, since we're talking so much about imagery, right? Or stereotype or propaganda, whatever. I mean, the, 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 the image out there, when, when lots of people talk about Korea out there, they're talking about North Korea. Um, you know, that, that's what you see on TV all the time, right? And, and in part, that sort of actually reflects well on South Korea because that means that South Korea is like a normal, adjusted, integrated place, part of the OECD, part of globalization, whatever, right? I mean, that's actually what you want, right? You don't actually want to be some kind of like bizarre outlier state that creates all kinds of trouble, right? I mean, it's nice to be like Korea or Canada or something like that where you're normalized. So it's not actually a bad thing, but in terms of profile, that's an issue. Um, so how do you counteract that? Um, to a certain extent, I think, um, uh, one of the reasons why the, the, the inter-Korean summit a couple weeks ago was so heavy, or a couple months ago, was so heavy on pageantry was in part because of this point, right? Um, one of the pushbacks on that was that there was too much symbolism, too much pageantry, and not enough substance. I do think, in terms of the strategic issues, I think that critique is correct, but I also think that part of the reason why you had so much emphasis on the TV, I mean, it was so well marketed, it was so very obviously slick, and I think that was in part because of the concerns that this panel is bringing up, right, is how do we push back on this image of sort of North Korea as like the mad uncle in the attic and start to bring North Korea in from the cold. And treating the North Koreans like a normalized state is part of that effort. Um, you could see the Singapore uh, summit is sort of the same way, right? The North Koreans met the American president. That's also sort of a signal of normalization. But I do think the senator's point maybe an hour ago was, was basically correct, that ultimately if this is not followed up by meaningful North Korean concessions, particularly on the strategic issues of nuclear weapons and missiles, this will eventually fall apart. Right? It, it, it just can't be photo ops. It, it can't. Um, and if that's all this is, it, 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 Christ, you know, it come Christmas or early next year, if, if we still haven't gotten anything substantial from the North Koreans, there will be a pretty substantial sort of hawkish or conservative backlash against this process, saying that the North Koreans took us for a ride and they just wanted the pictures and they got them and they haven't given us anything. So I think the, the, the challenge now is on the Moon government to make sure the North Koreans follow through with genuine concessions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Professor Kim? Thank you, uh, Ambassador Parvana. Um, public diplomacy is in critical juncture this century, not necessarily in the, in the good sense of the term. I mean, w what we are witnessing in this century is, uh, as uh, uh, Ambassador Park and, and other uh, distinguished uh, panelists uh, mentioned, the, the rise of uh, uh, nationalism, parochial nationalism, and the so-called, you know, the return of geopolitics, and the classical geopolitics, meaning that uh, the geopolitical competition, confrontation, competition between among uh, nation states. And particularly, we look at uh, North East Asia. We all know that, we all have seen for a long time the so called clash of national identities between and among uh, North East countries, particularly uh, the two Koreas, Japan, 
and China hindering the further collaboration uh, between and among those countries. I mean, the painful uh, collective memory of the past history, or actually has been deeply ingrained in as, as essential elements of national identities of those countries. Okay? And then uh, the, the, the past history actually has uh, weighed heavily on the present, and, it, and even, the, even the future. And my real concern here in this, uh, in this uh, geographical, I mean, geopolitical environment, my real concern is that what is the role of public diplomacy uh, for the past uh, couple of months? I think in North, on the Korean Peninsula in Northeast Asia, we truly see the emergence of uh, peace momentum, thanks to you know uh, uh, President Moon Jae-in's uh, enduring uh, you know effort and also a series of historic summits, including you know Trump Kim Jong Un summit. Okay, what if the countries in Northeast Asia, China, two Koreas, Japan, commit themselves to a particular and specific inclusionary role of establishing a peace regime on the Korean Peninsula in particular, and for that matter, establishing a, a, a common shared security system in Northeast Asia at large. I think that by that particular inclusionary role, we could expand, radically expand the boundaries of self, us. Okay, by, by incorporating Chinese, Japanese, North Koreans. For future directions of public diplomacy, I actually uh, propose two things. The first one is that, I mean, for the past 70 years or so, in terms of mode of communication, public diplomacy has evolved from monologic communication, you know, just like a Voice of America, uh, toward, and the, at, at the end of the century, turn of the century, Thanks, uh, uh, due in great part to the, to the information technology innovations in information uh, communication technologies, toward developed to uh, the, 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 the dialogic mode of communication. Okay. What if we could go one step further, as, as uh, Kadir mentioned, the collaborative mode of uh, uh, public diplomacy. When we launch a particular public diplomacy program, the South Korea does not do it alone, but we, we do it together, collectively, collaboratively, like, uh, together with the Japan, China, a particular program. Okay? That's collaborative public diplomacy. Another one is uh, themed public diplomacy. As I said, getting out of the, the black box of common band, we could move toward uh, inclusionary role identity, and then for the role Identity to be sustainable, I think we better conduct a themed public diplomacy, a okay, particular theme, whatever the theme is. But then the neutral value-based theme, it could be, you know, climate change, it could be peace building, it could be, you know, peaceful coexistence, which is, you know, are quite the, the, the neutral values, okay? Then I think uh, probably the public diplomacy could be heading for, heading toward in this uh, you know, gloomy uh, era of politics of exclusionary identity. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kim. Uh, we started our session with two uh, keeping uh, in mind two challenges. Uh, one is uh, how to deal with the nationalistic trend in this region, then how to, uh, what kind of uh, role public diplomacy can play in building solidarity and harmony in this region. Then the second question was uh, uh, how to support uh, peace process uh, on the peninsula from the, in the field of public diplomacy. And in my view, um, the answer to the first challenge is uh, collaborative uh, public uh, diplomacy, as many, many panelists emphasized. Well, we have to conduct uh, public diplomacy out to three major countries, uh, not just uh, to promote uh, our own national interest, but we have to conduct public diplomacy in order to contribute to 
regional and the global public goods. Northeast Asia can be a very interesting place to, to see how I mean, we work together to form a new world, new world order, uh, putting harmony and collaboration in ahead of uh, competition and the conflicts. Uh, then uh, also uh, public diplomacy in this region, uh, in the form of a collaborative public diplomacy, we can uh, have more uh, people to people interaction, especially among young people. Then we can uh, create a sense of uh, uh, Northeast citizenship in addition to each uh, national identity. Uh, so this we, uh, public diplomacy can uh, create regional identity, I believe. Uh, with respect to the second challenge, uh, the peace uh, process, uh, peace initiative on the Korean Peninsula, we talk about the, the, the issue of trust. Right. And uh, South North Summit and the U.S. Uh, TPRK Summit is uh, uh, just uh, a beginning as a first step, but very significant first step. Um, there is a long way to go, and the journey in uh, front of us uh, will be, uh, it won't be an easy one. Uh, it's a very, it will be very rocky one, especially uh, we do not have uh, trust on uh, each other. But uh, uh, trust is not precondition of interaction or uh, negotiation. Especially when we do not have trust, uh, we need more interaction to understand each other, to build the foundation uh, for communication. The last point is that um, public diplomacy is everybody's business, as you said. It's not monopolized by um, the government or formal institutions. Uh, you, you are young people. Uh, you are actually the real uh, public diplomat. So um, multicultural outlook is the key for the success of our future, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So I will uh, conclude. Mm -hmm. our session uh, by saying that uh, you are politician and you are scholar and uh, I'm diplomat and uh, you are media person but, and you are students uh, uh, but we are all uh, genuine diplomat in the field of public diplomacy. Thank you very much.